Welcome, good day, uh, to Chats with Champions, presented by Skiapa Library and sponsored by the first Dan Escada, which is now celebrating its 150th anniversary. It's located on Main Street and has 16 branches along the coast of Maine. At this time, I would like to ask you to uh, silence your electronic devices or shut off your phones. And I'd like to thank our videographer, Mal Gormley. I think it already videos this. And uh, you can always see it on YouTube or uh, on our site. Our next chats presenter will be Reja July on Thursday, December 4th, right here in the Porter Meeting Hall. The topic will be our immigrant neighbors. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, David Kramer. He is a retired United States Air Force Colonel whose 31 year career included enlisted service combat tour as an F-10 fighter pilot in Vietnam, nuclear alert for NATO in England, and two tours of duty as an attaché in U.S. embassies in Nigeria and Algeria. He also served as executive officer to the vice commander-in-chief of U.S. forces Europe, a division chief in Air Force plans for the Middle East and Africa <coughs> in the Pentagon, a base commander of an Air Force base in Korea, and as Chief of Foreign Liaison's Division of Defense Intelligence Agency, also in the Pentagon. David's presentation, in honor of Veterans Day, will recall his experiences from those assignments, as well as from the post, from post Air Force jobs, managing security for an oil company in Algeria, and as a contractor assisting the U.S. Army in logistics, getting to and operating in Bosnia. Some of those experiences are very topical including a car bomb attack in Germany and an Islamic terrorist attack aimed at toppling the government of Algeria. A native of West Hartford, Connecticut, David is a graduate of Bates College with a master's degree from Oran University. He's a distinguished graduate of the Air Force Command and Staff College and a graduate of the Naval National War College in Washington, D.C. David and his wife Vivian, a flight attendant for United Airlines, moved to the Mid-Coast in 1999 in our residence of Novoborough. It's my pleasure to introduce David Kramer. Thank you, Karen. I uh, need to somehow our photograph got moved uh, forward. So I don't know how to get it back. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for coming uh, this morning. I. Uh, I, I want to tell you that I love living here, but it's been kind of a circuitous path to get here. Um, I was born and raised in, in uh, Hartford, West Hartford, Connecticut, going to uh, high school there, and uh, then moving on in college to Bates. Uh, I was a history major there, and my going to Bates was not really surprising when you consider that I had a great uncle in the class of 1893, and my parents were both in the class of 1935. My brother went on to graduate in the class of 1965 with me uh, a couple of years earlier. While I was at Bates, I did a lot of sports, baseball, soccer, acted in plays, and this led to an agreement between me and Bates that maybe it would be a good idea if I took some time off. <laughs> <laughs> my, my doing so uh, brought to the forefront the fact that in 1962 there was a draft. And that draft meant that I was going to uh, have to take care of a, a service commitment some way. And by accident, uh, a recruiter called my house in West Hartford when I was there, and I got talking to him. He was looking for my brother. But we got a deal going where he says, hey, with all that college you have, Dave, you'll just go right into the Air Force, be enlisted, and automatically put into what they call the Airman Education and Commissioning Program. So you would, would go, go do your basic training and then be whisked off somewhere to be sent back to college to uh, get your final semester and graduate, and then go to officer training school, getting a commission. Wasn't true. <laughs> what a surprise. 
So what I ended up doing was going to basic training, going through it, doing the best I could, and, and discovering the strange thing that I absolutely loved it. I really, I found it was like a calling. I just felt like being in the Air Force at that time was what I was sort of meant to do. Recall that my father had been a uh, high school and college history professor, and the lesson was very well taught in our house that we owed a lot to this country and we were very fortunate to live in it. So the idea of uh, maybe coming to service in the Air Force was not such a stretch for me. Anyway, here I am in the Air Force, no automatic anything. But finally, I was able, after a year, I was able to uh, work a uh, release from active duty and get back to Bates where I graduated and then immediately got accepted to officer training school. And the, the interesting thing was, I didn't have to do that. I could have been done with my Air Force commitment, but I didn't want that. I wanted to keep on going. So I went to officer training school at Lackland Air Force Base, graduated as one of the last class that uh, was commissioned under John Kennedy in November 5th, 1963. After officer training school and a fresh new second lieutenant, I said, well, you know, I'm in the Air Force. I sure would like to fly. And the Air Force once again said, not so fast. We like you in this maintenance career field. And they sent me off to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. Northwest Florida, I know it. Uh, and Eglin is a, at that time in the 60s, was really the Air Force's laboratory for the growing conflict and military effort in Vietnam. Huge reservation in northwest Florida, uh, over which was flown many, many test missions, practice missions, uh, trying to test all sorts of weaponry, all sorts of tactics, and there I was in the midst of that, but yet not going to pilot training. Happily, uh, there I was at, in England, and I got an opportunity in, so I think it was in 1966, because I worked, I had started working for the commanding general of the center, a two-star. I got a chance to uh, hang around at test operations, looking for a ride. The guy who ran that thing was a guy named Lieutenant Colonel John Deutschendorf. He had a son who was pretty successful as a musician, but he took the name Denver instead. <laughs> <laughs> but so Deutschendorf helped me get a ride. I got the thing out of the flight suit and everything. I felt pretty cool. And as it happened, I got in the back seat of an F-100. That, uh, that ride, I kind of fell in love with the airplane. The adventure of it all, I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever done. And that was what I wanted to do. So the rest of the time was, let's get out of here. Let's get to pilot training so I can see compete for an F-100 assignment. The commanding general kind of liked me, I guess, because one day we were having a chat about a visitor in his office, and I mentioned that he started telling uh, pilot stories, and I said, boy, I really want to go. And he just turned around to his call director, picked up a, a, butt, a phone, punched the button of the personnel director for the Proving Ground Center, and said, and I quote, hey, Nick, young Kramer wants to go to pilot training, and I think he should go. Plunk. By the time I got back to my office, I'm a first lieutenant. The colonel was waiting for me. And the, my uh, application was soon done, and I was off to pilot training. <laughs> pilot training, uh, and once I found out I was going to pilot training, I immediately had to buy a Jaguar XK. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I, well, I was going to have flight pay. And here's the way to get rid of that. So the year of 53 weeks began at Moody Air Force Base, Georgia, and involved 30 hours in something called the T-41, who many of you who have aviation experience will recall as the Cessna 172. The Air Force used it to inex inexpensively get rid of the people who just weren't cut out to fly. So I had 30 hours in that, including a first solo, which was very exciting. And this is about the same time as the Six-Day War, to put it in, in 1967. So let's uh, put 
to keep it uh, oriented to time. I went on to uh, finish that uh, tour, then the, we moved to the, the small twin jet T-37 made by Cessna. It was called the Tweety Bird, <coughs> and it was like a 6,000 pound dog whistle. It was tre <laughs> tremendously loud, and we were very careful about putting, uh, wearing ear protection as we go to and from the flight line before we started. Uh, whether my hearing really got damaged by that, I don't know, but if you ask Vivian, <laughs> I'm sure she would indicate that yes, maybe, maybe it did. But uh, so the T-37, first jet solo, they throw you in a pool and all that sort of thing, pretty exciting. And then uh, 120 hours in the T-38 jet talent. And this is a T-38, which is uh, supersonic and uh, all sorts of much more advanced formation, night flying, etc. And finally, I graduated high enough in my class to request and get an F-100 assignment. And so it was off to uh, Luke Air Force Base in Glendale, Arizona in June of 1968 to, uh, with my new shiny wings on, to go and start my six-month training to use an airplane for combat. Yeah, uh, I had a picture up there beforehand and got switched off somehow. Uh, but let's just move on. The, the airplane I'm going, going to talk about is, is this one, the F-100D. And we trained uh, in this, this version, which was preceded by the A, two A models, this one and this one. Those A models, and I guess I should stay over here, but you can see the short tail on that one and the longer tail here, neither of which was sufficient to keep it from killing a lot of people. Uh, by the time the uh, F-100C came along, and that was the one we were to train in, uh, things were much, much better. Here's the class I was in uh, at uh, Luke Air Force Base. That's, uh, that's the uh, me. And, uh, the instructors were along here. The great Skipper Webb, who was the uh, our flight leader, my instructor pilot, Jerry Salome, both of them uh, who have passed away now. And, one, and the, the student class is right here. And uh, Charlie Massey is one of the guys who uh, was lost during our tour in Vietnam. But meeting the, F, uh, meeting the F-100 and uh, getting together, and going through just class after class and mission after mission as they introduced going to the gunnery range, air refueling, night flying, night ground attack, and all of those sorts of things uh, until we were to graduate. But as, we, uh, as soon as we got there and got our first flights in the F-100, the, the immediate thing was, well, we've got to take a hero picture. And sure enough, <laughs> so he go out and uh, took a photograph in front of uh, an airplane. At the end of these training missions over the Arizona desert, this is in Glendale, the Luke Air Force Base is in Glendale, west of the field. And after that was over, after you'd finished the, uh, uh, your flight and you'd done what you had to do, if you had some fuel to burn out on the way back to Luke, we did it in one of the most fun things I've ever done, and that is that. Oh my God! We get just get down low over the desert and hammer, just go fast. And this, you'll notice too, that this is the F-100C, which we trained in. See, that's the small thing on the uh, tail, and this did not have any flaps. So you flew final approach in this airplane at 185 knots, yeah. plus fuel. So two pound, for every thousand pounds of fuel, you added a couple of knots. That was uh, kind of exciting. But, it, but at, Luke, at Luke, it was not a big deal because you were in the desert. The weather was perfect all the time, which was ideal for getting you training, except for the fact that you need instrument training as well. So that was big fun. Let me show you the, the airplane, as I mentioned. We're learning how to use it as a weapon system now. And the F-100, when it came in in the mid-50s, was as diverse as you could get at the time as a weapon system. This photograph shows some of the, uh, 
weapons that it carried. These are rockets. No, no really inaccurate things. They're very sensitive to G-loading if you fire them. Here are the four cannons, which are M39 cannons, 20 millimeter cannons. There were four of them, <coughs> two of them in the two-seat model, but four of them. And then these up in here, we'll talk, to, talk about later. These are sh what we call shape charges. That uh, Those aren't real ones, but they are the nukes that this airplane was uh, able to carry. And I'll talk a little bit about that later when we get, get to England. The, uh, the things on the wing, that, those are fuel tanks. And uh, the, there were four stations outboard and inboard on the, on the wings, and then a satellite station, which we didn't usually carry the stores on. But that was the airplane as it was uh, set up. All the weapons, that's a publicity photograph the Air Force made to show its versatility. This shows the gun being loaded by one of the crew chiefs. And in, internally, the gun had a total of 800 rounds loaded. And at the rate of fire, um, and they had around, you had about eight seconds or so. That's all. Yeah, two, 200 rounds per, per gun, and they'd fire together. And as you, if you were firing the gun, you pull the trigger, and you, it would be just that kind of a, a feeling, a big vibration. And your the pipper on the screen would dance uh, to show you. Yeah, and you soon see the, a few tracers, and you see the explosions of the ammunition were uh, high explosive heads. On the way, having graduated from the F-100 school, uh, the, next, the next job was to prepare yourself for the orders I got, which was Vietnam. And there were three different survival schools en route. One was a regular survival school at Fairchild Air Force Base, Washington, which involved a three-day prisoner of war experience, which was very, very effective and convincing. I, these were Air Force people who you were convinced were North Vietnamese and that uh, they didn't like you very much and they subjected you to all sorts of uh, training and, and stress positions, shall we say, to get you ready. And what it did to, for me is say, I don't want to ever get captured. <laughs> the next one was uh, Sea Survival off Homestead in Florida where you learned how to come down and deploy the, uh, your, your raft and get into it should you be shot down over water, which was the, the desirable thing. If you were injured or you were going to have to bail out for some reason, get feet wet, as we said, and do it there. And then at least the enemy wasn't going to get you. Our guys uh, almost certainly would. And the final one, en route to Vietnam. And this is, now we're, we move forward to February of 1969, flying to Vietnam via Clark Air Base in the Philippines. At Clark, we had something called Jungle Survival. Jungle Survival was fascinating because we actually were brought out to a, a, the jungle, the Philippine jungle, and stayed there for two or three days. A couple of uh, instructors from a, 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 an indigenous group called the Negritos. And little guys, brilliant, they just were so at home in the jungle. We learned all sorts of things. And the effect of all this was to say, you know, I can, I can hack this. If I have to punch out over the jungle, I can, I can deal with it. Don't want to, but I can. <laughs> and then finally it was time to get to the base and get going. And so I went first to Phuket Air Base, which on the, uh, the map I see over here, Phuket Air Base is right there. And uh, it's just 20 miles in, inland from Pignon. And that's where I began in the 355th TAC Fighter Squad. The 355th TAC Fighter Squad was unique in the Air Force because it was comprised of half Air National Guard people and half regular Air Force guys like me. That was unique. There were several Air National Guard squadrons helping us. But this was the only one that combined forces. And these guys were from DC. Uh, DC Guard and the Jersey City Guard. And they were most of them were airline pilots, uh, really patriots in my view, because they, they volunteered to go do this and, and serve a year of flying instead of flying uh, 
the wings of man, Eastern Airlines, up and down the east coast of the country. Great guys, and I ran into one of them much, much later on a TWA flight. So let's, let's go through a typical mission. Um, and, and I'm trying to figure out what might be unusual to you. If I just go through a typical F-100 combat mission, and maybe if there are questions later, you can ask different things. But, and I'll vary a little bit about what kind it is. But let's pretend that this one that we're going to go on is going to go up here to the Bugia Pass. One of the major uh, missions was to interdict the Ho Chi Minh Trail and the way that uh, North Vietnam was able to get supplies and men to its insurgency operations in the south. This was a continuing effort for as long as the war ran and was only semi-successful. But uh, it was, that wasn't to say we didn't try, because we certainly did. When you went, the, the mission started by, you'd be on the schedule. And whether you were lead or a wingman, that mattered about how many hours you had. Uh, flight lead came after you were an experienced guy, and they felt that you could uh, take that on. Na naturally enough, I began as a wingman. <clears throat> so we'd go down, down to the squadron, check the schedule, and here I am, let's say I'm flying, uh, flying number two or number three, number four, on a four-ship mission to drop weapons on the Mugia, uh, Mugia Pass. The first thing we do was get the briefing, which involved intel, weather, and in all sorts of target information uh, about what we were trying to do and the target tactics. When that was finally finished, we, we went out and got our personal equipment on, which I will show you in the next photograph, involved you know, a survival vest and an anti-G suit. And you get out to the airplane and meet, the first thing you do is meet with a crew chief. This guy is John Powderly, he was my crew chief. We were each assigned an airplane, which we flew if it was available. Mine was tail number 314, and it's replicated in this model that was made for me right here. So the airplane, is, as you saw, was in a, uh, kind of in a revetment to prevent it from uh, attacks from uh, the enemy. And the first thing you did, after you did the, the pre-flight, and here, wait a minute, yeah, this is a pre-flight of my airplane, me doing the pre-flight, and it's a photograph that I didn't know existed until April of this year, when I got it through an email uh, of a bunch of photographs, and I said, holy cow, that's me and that's my airplane. And, uh, and sure enough it is, I'm doing the pre-flight, this is at Cameron Bay after I'd flown down for a, uh, a uh, static display for the Assistant Secretary of Defense one day. So I'm getting ready to go back and join the war. But it illustrates the walk around that you did in a pre flight. Okay. Ooh. Next, you start up, get in the airplane and start it up. Sometimes you would use a cart start. And you can see the smoke under the airplane billowing out. And that's, that's because it was almost like a big shotgun shell that got the turbines, move, turbines moving. Uh, normally it was a compressed air system, but we sometimes did the car start, which was pretty spectacular, and it stunk, too. <laughs> Next, you double check in on the radio and taxi out. And then this one is taken in the army area. Here you can see uh, at the end of the runway, the, the bombs that were loaded on the airplanes were not armed until just the last minute. And you can see the, the weapons guy down here uh, doing the arm. Notice here in this photograph to this, uh, this thing, that's the refueling probe, which is off the right wing, and just sort of set like this. Cuts just enough out of your view that you couldn't look at it when you refuel it. Okay, you get on the runway, taxi onto the runway, elements of two, and let's say we're going this four ship up to Mugia Pass. And so we take off, 
as soon as you take off 350 knots out of afterburn, rolls the, the gear and the flaps are up, and you start a gentle turn, and this number two just comes in, and they join up for the formation this way. You just do an arc until everybody's joined up, and off you go. Well, heavily laden with weapons, climbing up to 16,000 feet or so, you used a lot of fuel. And as you can see, going up there was a fair distance. And so that mean, means we had to look for a gas. And so we'd go and refuel, and uh, Rodney Boo with a tanker, somewhere over right uh, kind of the border of North, uh, North Vietnam and Laos, or South Vietnam and Laos. This is what it would look like as you would approach the tanker. From this taken from the cockpit. And you can see the, you tried to get it into the, into the green, and uh, that would be, uh, that would be correct. You were just flying formation of the tanker. You set right in the cockpit, you flew forward until the, uh, the knuckle on the thing was, even with the, the camera box, just flew forward gently, and hopefully your, the basket would intersect, the basket would intersect with that probe that you saw. It was, I always thought it was pretty sporty. <laughs> there's, there's a view that, that you have from the boomer looking down at your airplane coming in to refuel. After you get hooked up, and here's a picture, now you're all hooked up. Now you can really see, well, this, is a perfect, this is the perfect position here, with a little kink in the hose here, so that 7,000 pounds per minute being transferred. And as that happens, of course, the airplane becomes heavier, the angle of attack changes, so you're always having to fly the airplane uh, during, the, during the time of refueling. Meanwhile, these other guys are just waiting for their turn. After we were all done with the refueling, we'd have, oh, what happened? Uh, I don't know how, I missed the picture. Anyway, the picture was a picture of the, uh, the airplane breaking away and the fuel just would spew out on a spectacular sight. Now we're just flying to the mission. This is, this is me, in fact, my airplane. Then uh, toward the target in August of 1969. Finally, we get to rendezvous with a forward air controller. In this case, this is an OV-10 Bronco, and this is not so much a rendezvous, but this is what it looked like. You'd, you'd get up there with your flight, you'd find the guy, he would then get in contact with you, put you in on the target. He'd say, and he'd give you the up-to-date briefing of what gun sites were active, what he wanted you to do, if there were friendlies in the area, if it were in South Vietnam, say, what run-ins you should use or should not use. And so, thus briefed, the flight would set up a circle of four airplanes separated and in a circle around the top of the target, maybe seven or 8,000 feet. And, identifying the target. And then at some point, lead would go in, roll in. Shortly thereafter, two, three, and four, all at different angles at different timings to try and confuse the ground fire that was sure uh, to come at that point. This shows kind of a rolling in motion here. Now let's, let's say this is a, the pull off of the target. Here you see the guy right here, having dropped ordnance on uh, some site. This is not in the movie of past, by the way, but this is a, a typical uh, pull-off. And you were very low at this point. This one, you're kind of at the most vulnerable with, uh, for the ground fire. And this shows what we call close air support. And this was just outside the base uh, at Benoit, in fact, which is north of Saigon. And, uh, those were the, always the most satisfying missions in that you were really helping someone uh, who uh, needed it. Troops in contact was the one that we liked the best. Having done that, we pull off the target, join up, assess each other for damage by just fly up and just fly down underneath and look up at the guy. He'd look, everybody would check each other out. You'd get bomb damage assessment from the forward air controller and then head back to your base. And our base was Tuiwa, and this shows us, shows the airplane approaching to get into the traffic pattern uh, to land. So that was fairly typical. There were lots of variations on those missions, but this is this one of them. After I was finally done, and uh, the flight was over, uh, and all the flights were over, and into 
December of 1969, uh, there was a there was a truck, a fire truck out at the uh, end of the runway, uh, right where I was supposed to park, and it, I meant it was your champagne flight. When you were done, you never knew when it was going to happen, but you would come in, there would be the people, and that was it for you. You, uh, you were going home. And so I was pretty happy there. In a bottle of champagne with my coochie. And then uh, back to the hooch, and where there was sing song and party and all. This guy is Tony McPeak, who went on to become Chief of Staff of the Air Force. He was a major then. This guy, Pete James Fergatus, lives in Massachusetts. He's, uh, he was a forward air controller, one of those guys in the little airplanes putting me in. And Dave Wilson is one of the uh, guys I mentioned who was a uh, National Guard guy. He was from the Sioux City, Iowa National Guard. All good guys. And this was at, uh, at Foot Guy Air Base. So with, with Vietnam uh, kind of done, oh, I should say one thing, you could be scrambled off alert, too. The, that was a fried mission. On alert, you would do the same thing, but you would be sleeping right at, in a building right beside the flight line with the airplane cocked, all ready to go. And then when the phone rang, that meant there was troops in contact, or you, they needed you. And you'd race out, get in the airplane, and get off the ground, and hoped within 10 minutes after the bell rang. And you might have been asleep, too. That would happen rain or shine, day or night. And it was very, the most exciting flying, I think, of all was the alert because you knew you were responding to somebody who really needed you. My assignment following uh, Vietnam was to England, NATO, the, the 492nd TAC Fighter Squadron at RAF Lake in East Anglia. That was a, a great assignment and very, very different. One of the first things about England is the fact that there is a lot of weather. And within a month of my getting there, February 1st of 1970, uh, I was on the wing with a guy named Larry Wagner. We took off, flew, and even though the weather was kind of dodgy, the wing wanted to get the flying in. They needed to get the flying hours, and so the whole wing was flying different missions. And we were doing something, and all of a sudden we hear weather recall, weather recall. And so we arrived back at what we call the initial approach fix which is just about at the edge of East Anglia and, and the North Sea to make the long approach down into Lake Eneath. But we're starting to hear that there are other airplanes further away who have less fuel than we do, who need to get ahead of us. So we let them go ahead. They sink into the holding pattern ahead of us. And to make it shorter, by the time we went down, we were pretty skosh on fuel too. And the weather had really closed in with heavy rain and, uh, and it was, Radar was losing people in the, in the ground control approach final. We, we went down and were forced to break out because somebody had missed their private, previous approach. It was all like a chain of, of events and we suffered and so we were broken out and I've, I have this picture up here because these are like any airplanes and, this, and we were in a for, trying to do a formation landing just to, so there wouldn't have to be two airplanes. Uh, landing separately and thus using more fuel. We got down, we got broken out, we crossed the Lake and Heath runway, uh, and I could look down and actually see the runway very briefly, and we got picked up by Mildenhall ground approach, and the Mildenhall is a nearby base. We came around and started a, a, uh, a, an approach there. The GCA controller and the heavy rain lost us, and, I, this, and, and this is, this, I have this photograph up here because this is my position. I was, as I said, I was a new guy, so I was the wingman. Larry Wagner, bless him, was uh, the lead at that flight, and I happened to be on his right wing. And we are really low on fuel, and we're looking for the runway at Milden Hall. As we came in and got lower and lower toward, uh, toward the uh, minimum, nothing, just rain, just rain, and, and we've lost contact, and, and Larry said, Pressing the minimums, and I said, yeah, good. And so we, we kept on going. And since I was looking through him, through his uh, cockpit this way, the wind is all just looking at the lead. He's not looking at navigating, right? He's looking out the lead airplane. I happened to see through his airplane that strobe, you know, the, the running rabbit, we call it, 
And they said, I said, lead, left 10 o'clock stroke. And, and he, he looked over, saw it, and he took a big, huge thumbs up, and we gently cr crabbed over to the center line and got it on the ground. This was, it came to be known as Black Thursday, and no one was lost in this thing. It was a re remarkable problem, but everybody got it on the ground. There was some pretty good flying done, and Larry Wagner was one of these guys. Anyway, uh, as he's taxing it in, since we were so close to Lake and Heath, we could still be on the radio with Lake and Heath Ground Control. And I said, well, Icon 2-1, say your intentions. And Larry said, well, I think I'll just see if we can find a place to park this son of a gun before it flames out. <laughs> it was that close. You know, I was absolutely convinced that we were going to have enough to pull up after missed approach and punch out. And then an F-100 airplane was going to fall somewhere in East Anglia in a fairly populous area. When I first got there, there was a saying that said, look, they had a terrible uh, flying safety year in 1969. They said, uh, if you want an F-100, buy some real estate in East Anglia. <laughs> <laughs> right. The mission at the mission Lake and Heath was one of we were sitting nuclear alert, we were maintaining currency for conventional war, but here was a whole new deal. Now, we were sitting nuclear alert, we had to get qualified to do that, of course. The Air Force, and I think our whole government, was especially careful about uh, preparations uh, and entrusting anybody to nuclear weapons. We never flew with them, for instance. But you flew low-level low missions, and the low-level mission would be taken out of up Lake and Heath, single ship usually, flying over toward and letting down over the Normandy coast, flying in at 500 feet above the Normandy beaches, going to Silo, which was the first turn point, and then a zigzagging pattern over uh, France, using only timing, uh, or time, distance, and heading. There was no GPS, there was none of that stuff, to find a target and pr practice delivering uh, a weapon on a bridge over the Loire River, which would have been nasty for the wine, but it just happens. <laughs> so we do that and come home. That was the that was the uh, typical training for uh, that kind of a mission. In doing low level, though, things could get messed up, and I've got to tell a very brief story about my close friend, the late Don Smith. And uh, clicking the wrong thing here. Here we go. Don. <laughs> There it is. Don Smith is the guy you see right here. And Don and his, his leader, or his wingman, uh, Tom Hall, were flying a low level in Holland. And they didn't let you fly as low in Holland as they did in France. So it's about a thousand feet and it's pretty hazy, and they happen to fly past their turn point. And in flying past the turn point, and they're flying as a two ship at this time, but in route formation. And they passed this giant TV tower that, that, that carries all the TV signals at that time, in the early 70s, for the Netherlands. And so Tom Hall, who went on to retire as a Brigadier General, he said, hey, Lee, did you see that TV tower? And Don Smith laconically replied, see it. I just hit the sun. <laughs> in fact, he had torn out, he hit one of the guy wires, you know, these big tall TV towers, and he hit the guy wire, tore up his airplane terribly, and in a tremendous speed of airmanship, got the airplane to a base right near Amsterdam called Schusterberg Air Base, Camp New Amsterdam, the other title for it, got the airplane on the ground where it rested from then on. Mm -hmm. never flew again. But a great job of this wonderful guy who I miss to this day. Anyway, finally I flew my low level, got qualified, and was put on nuclear alert. And I got to tell you folks that that was one of the most profound experiences of my life, though it didn't involve any flying or any delivery or, or even flying with a new but I was entrusted with one. And right at the end of the runway, there was a, a barn with a, with a painted area around it, 
with a cocked, perfectly maintained F-100, and this gleaming cylindrical object beneath it, which was called the B-61, and it was an adjustable yield nuclear weapon. Should the unthinkable occur, it was my job, and those of many others who were also sitting alert, to take off, fly one of those low levels, except this time not over France, but headed east. And somewhere in Eastern Europe, to my target, which I had memorized, and you would be thrilled on this, do the delivery and, uh, and then pretty much pack it in because although they said you'd get back, it seemed to us you wouldn't. Now, you knew you weren't going to go. You knew that this was part of the nuclear deterrence that characterized the Cold War for all that time. And yet, and yet, but what if? And every now and then they get you that what if by conducting things called gun smoke exercises. The gun smokes were, uh, they just scramble you and you'd race out to the airplane, sit in it, and, and then they'd start authenticating codes. And meaning if the code matches, you're going. And you'd finally get down to the final thing and the code wouldn't match and they'd call it off. And how do you spell relief? <laughs> but, uh, it was a remarkable, uh, a remarkable timing, and uh, so that was that. Uh, one more picture here. It's some other guys at uh, Lake Mead. This guy is Jerry Key. Jerry Key uh, was one of my buddies, and he still is. And he became a Continental Airlines pilot and flew with my wife Vivian, who's sitting right up in the back there, in her early days before I knew Vivian, uh, she flew uh, with Jerry Key on the same crew. And this guy, Bob Salisbury, he and I were friends then, hadn't seen him in 45 years, and then we went to a banquet in August, and he was my sat next to me at dinner. <laughs> small, uh, the small world kind of thing. I know I'm, uh, what I might ought to do is, uh, is stop now, and uh, because now it was going to be, we're pretty much done with F100 days. I've uh, talked for uh, 42 minutes or so, and we want to give uh, time for questions. Just if you're interested, at USAFE, we, we had a, uh, a, a terrorist bomb happen, and then in Algeria, of course, Islamic fundamentalist terrorism happened. And these were things that happened uh, later on. But at the end of uh, end of that uh, England tour, I came back to command staff college, to homestead as an instructor pilot, and one day flying as an instructor pilot. Ah, didn't so much. ah here here are the guys who converted to the F4 Phantom. This airplane is shown here. And and as the F-100 went out of its service life, uh, the pilots were given other assignments. And I was one of the ones selected, uh, and we stood, uh, all of us got on a wing of an F-100 before we went off to, back to Luke again to learn how to fly the Phantom. I went on to be an instructor pilot and in the Phantom at uh, Homestead Air Force Base in Florida. And one day, I was sitting in the back seat of that baby, giving one of the guys in my flight as a flight commander a ride when uh, something happened flying that I had never experienced flying before, though I knew pretty much what it was. And when you're driving along a highway in the summer and you see that shimmering light, uh, I had this in the left field of my vision. And it's described medically as shimmering scotoma, which means blindness. But what it's caused by is migraine. It's what's called ocular migraine, and it's a manifestation of migraine without the headache, without the nausea, and all that, which my mom had had. And, but it, it was one of those things that probably is not a good idea to fly with. And so, uh, as a result of that, I went to the operations officer and described what had happened in the air after I had Said, taking the airplane from Al Koth, who was flying in front. I said, Al, we're changing the mission. Uh, let me have the airplane. I got an area to work in, in, this in South Florida, and just did every kind of aerobatic maneuver I could think of. Well, <laughs> to, to the left. Just had as much fun as I could pack in. 
albeit from the back seat, and then came around, and my purpose of being in the back seat was to get a back seat landing, and I sure did. Uh, but I got, you know, just peeking out the corner to make the back seat landing at Homestead, and that was it. Then I went in and said, hey, this has happened to me. And, uh, you know, they're not my airplanes, but they are my fellow citizens on the ground, <laughs> whatever I might hit if I keep flying. So that was the end of Air Force flying, active Air Force flying. And uh, so that might be a, a good place to, to stop initially. No? Nope. <laughs> um, okay. My next assignment, now on the ground, I wanted something as far away from flying as I could get. And that turned out to be uh, in the Defense Intelligence Agency and the Air Force as an air attaché, which is a military attaché in an embassy and this time in Lagos, Nigeria. What a difference from a flight line uh, to go to be in the embassy there. Working for three bosses, really. Uh, the Air Force, I was the Air Force representative uh, accredited to their Air Force, the Nigerian Air Force. I was also working for DIA. We were very interested, of course, in the fact that, that the Nigerians also had Russian uh, training organizations training some of their flight uh, flyers. And, uh, and, and last but not least, the ambassador, who had his own kind of State Department uh, necessities. We, uh, we hosted a presidential visit while I was in Nigeria, which as the air attaché meant Dave handles Air Force One. They did send a, uh, a, an advance guy out, and we worked for 30 days to try and get uh, the perfect uh, setup for Air Force One. And it was difficult to convince the Nigerians, really, that, okay, at 10.30 p.m. precisely on this take spot on this ramp, <laughs> the President of the United States is going to be standing in that doorway. You know, this was a country where uh, there was a lot of any time from now. <laughs> but, uh, and in fact, that all happened. And it, was a, it was really a thrilling uh, experience. A nice little end of it. This is Jimmy Carter in, in February of 1978. And because his aide was a good guy, I happen to mention that when he was going to meet embassy families, that my daughter's birthday was April 3rd. And so uh, the president selected her and gave her a kiss. There's a nice photograph of it that she has uh, on her birthday before he went away. After, after Nigeria, off I went to headquarters Air Force Europe to be the uh, exec to the uh, vice commander in chief. And on August 31st of 1981, I had gotten there before the general, and we had the classified out and the different papers that he had to work on during that course of that day. And then at, uh, at exactly 7.21, and the time was fixed by the clock in my BMW, which was parked at the front, a huge bomb exploded in our lot. And it was, these guys were the, the Red Army faction of the Bader Meinhof gang. And they recall those 80s kind of uh, anarchist terrorists of those days. The key here, and the key later, when I got to uh, Algeria, was they didn't want to die. This was not, so, when it, it all changes when there's a suicide bomb going off. This, these guys drove a, a Volkswagen Passatian, parked in the visit parking lot, got out. This, the guy who drove that car got on the back seat of the motorcycle, which had accompanied him, and away they went and made their escape. Shortly thereafter, the bomb went off. Now, imagine, think of the security difference in 1981, then, that they could do that, be that close. But here's what the uh, parking lot looked like. Yeah, it's this is what's left of my BMW oh. right there. And, and the bomb, my, my car was parked uh, right here, and the bomb went uh, just opposite, in, in other words. And so it just got really blown up. I think it saved the life of a colleague of mine, Ruth Anderson, who was at the mailbox mailing a letter at that time, which was right back here. And I think uh, my car probably shielded her and kept her alive. 
Nobody was killed, five people injured. It made us change the way we looked at the Germans. Everybody is, is at one of them. You know, it, it just changed your whole, it was a very sobering uh, moment. And uh, I'll ne never forget it, of course. After coming back from, uh, from Germany then in 83, I had a year at the National War College, which was wonderful. And I thank my, uh, my hero and, and sponsor, Lieutenant General Bob Mason, for helping me get both to be a colonel and to be at the National War College. I went out after that uh, war college in, in uh, Fort Leslie McNair in Washington, D.C. I went on to uh, have the Middle East Africa Plans and Policy Division in the Pentagon for two years, which was a, a, a great time. Happily, it was nothing like the time that had, has uh, come to be now. But uh, And then it was relatively sleepy. We were worried about the Iran-Iraq War in those days. And, and my cousin Ralph going up and down the Persian Gulf in super tankers, worrying about exosets and mines and that sort of thing. Then I got my dream, which was to get my own command. I went to Korea for a year at a base called Kunsan on the, on the uh, South China Sea. And uh, this was, uh, I was the base commander of the 8th Combat Support Group, an F-16 wing, the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing. Uh, I got to fly a couple of times, but because of you know, the eyes, I flew in a two-seat version uh, of the airplane, and it was really familiarization, familiarization only. But what if sports car was the F-16? <laughs> I then came back, came home, and had two years at uh, foreign liaison, uh, the chief of foreign liaison for the Defense Intelligence Agency in the Pentagon. This was. Commanding all the folks who, uh, the folks who, who were uh, attachés to Washington now, all the foreign defense attachés, and they had to be accredited through me, and uh, and it was a fascinating uh, group of men. Some controversial, that some that the countries wanted them out of their own countries, sent them to Washington. Let them <laughs> and it was interesting because we also worked hosting the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the intelligence, military intelligence chiefs for all the other, our other countries. And uh, that, that was a fascinating thing because we, I was working for Secretary of Defense Cheney and the uh, chairman of the Joint Chief was Colin Powell. And very, very interesting. Cheney always very, very formal and correct and thorough. And uh, Colin Powell much, much friendlier. But I eventually was given the assignment to go be the defense attaché and air attaché in Algeria. Colin Powell says, hey, Dave, don't forget to say, say hello to all my friends in Algeria with a wink. Don't think he had too many friends in Algeria. <laughs> <laughs> this a uh, couple of pictures more of the, uh, the bombing. That's uh, out front, up front of the headquarters. And there's another picture from, from the window showing my PMW. And you can see where the mailbox is in the background that probably Say uh, Ruth Anderson. Um, I do have to move along. So um, my attaché tour in, in Algeria saw the onset of Islamic fundamentalist terrorism there. However, in this case, it was kind of designed to topple uh, what they saw as an illegitimate military government that was not answering citizens' needs. They had opened the door by allowing an Islamic party to compete for elections and surprise, surprise, they won big because there was a promise that maybe they'd be responsive whereas the governmental party wasn't. And this caused that government to fall, the military took over, and the military, uh, it's been said of Algeria that in most cases uh, countries have a, uh, have a military, but in Algeria's case, the military had a country. So let me uh, let me uh, let me stop there and, and see if there are any uh, any possible questions. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, uh, that was 
targeted you. Sure. It's, it's, it varied tremendously. And if in country in South Vietnam, when you're flying close air support for the Army, it was largely uh, small arms fire and like 50 caliber machine gun fire. And which could be daunting because you were down in the weeds with them. And you saw that picture of the close air support. You know, you're really low and you have to arrive at a straight and level tracking solution eventually. You'd fly a curved linear approach, but there's a point where you've got to line up and, and put your stuff on the target. And, you know, you just see stuff coming at you, uh, just every now and then the tracers. And you knew there were other uh, weapons or other bullets beside the tracers. So it was small, small arms there, but in, uh, in Laos on the Ho Chi Minh Trail and some of those choke points like Mugia Pass, 37 millimeter, 23 millimeter, and, uh, and sometimes 57. I don't think I ever saw 57, but I certainly saw 37 and 23. And 37 looked like red golf balls coming up, kind of like a knuckleball if you're a hitter, just like this, and then going by you. And happily, they went by me. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, let me raise a point here. You got it's, it's being lucky, not so much being good. There's a plenty of great fight pilots that uh, did, didn't make it. And it's just a matter of golden babies, really. So the, 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 the whole gamut from 57, 37, 23 millimeter, and small arms fire. There was one particular, particularly awful weapon called the CSU-23, a four-barrel 23 millimeter thing that would just throw barrage fire lead that you would then fly through. If they could draw the lead on you, uh, and that was, that was a terrifying thing. And happily, that one got me. Yes, David. That's it. You call out a career. You showed up here for you. I have a question. After you flew a mission, you said that there was, um, you waited while they did a bomb damage assessment. Yes. Is that because you'd go back in if it wasn't effective? You, yeah, that, ha that happened, but it was unusual. You really, during the course of the mission, the forward air controller and your own uh, viz could tell you if you were, had been effective. And, you oftentimes would be heading home all the time as the forward air controller then gave you your bomb damage assessment, which you then reported to, to And the, 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 the mission today you described, yeah. would that be the same today? I, you know, I don't know exactly how it is. The navigation certainly is easier. A lot, I think there's a lot more single ship missions with stealth. You know, the, uh, the bombers, they're stealthy and also they have radar guided. Uh, so one guy might be the designator while the other guy looses the weapon outside an envelope and the bomb sort of flies to the target. The you preparation, see this, preparation for the day. Preparation is pretty much, I think that's pretty much the same, yeah. The, uh, what we carried, we carried a weapon, you know, in case you had to punch out, it was a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver. One of my friends needed it and was successful using it but in getting recovered. Mm -hmm. That was on, on him and he got him and then was picked up. Uh, a big thank you to the people who were the air rescue people. Mm -hmm. They never left you behind. Mm -hmm. An important lesson, I think, in this day and age when we look back at people being left behind. Mm -hmm. They never did. And we counted on them. Anybody else? Yes? David, yeah, would you be so kind as to explain the significance of your pen? Your lapel? Uh, okay, that's a, it's just a lapel pin version of the Distinguished Flying Cross. Yes, yes. Would you explain why you received it? Um, well, in Laos, the last mission uh, out of Phuket Air Base before we transferred to Fu Tuiwa Air Base uh, was a mission, a two ship mission with Billy Reisman and I. We flew up. He had a, a special kind of, of bombs, you know, horrible weapons when you think about it uh, to the humanitarian sense. But it was to deny passage along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And he rolled in at a place called Chapone in Laos and did this bum 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 bum, dropping them out, and so they all floated down. And then we joined up, and we were going to just then head back and land at Tuiwa, which is going to be our new home for the rest of our tour. Immediately, the forward air controller, Misty, guts on the horn and says, any fighters within my hearing, I've got an active three-position three, three position 
a 23 millimeter sight here, uh, please respond. And so Willie, who's uh, Icon 2-1, or Sun Valley 3-1, says, uh, says, Roger. And, uh, and off we went to rendezvous with this guy. And we did. Make a long story shorter, we did a circle around the base, and the, the forward air controller has to describe it because you can't get close because they're really, it's a three position 23 site, so pretty deadly. And, uh, and we, we held pretty high too at this time to get set up and be briefed. Uh, and, and then we said, okay, let's go. And so Reisman rolls in here. I'm about here on the wheel around the thing. And, and he rolls in here and I rolled in here. And we both went down the down the chute. Willie Pickles and meanwhile, you know, it's, it's lit up there. It's pretty scary. It, but um, got off and and the, his bombs, which he salvo, uh, the two of them, and and I was dropping them too. Also, uh, they went right where they needed to go. Mine did too, and we went off. And the second pass was much easier, much less resistance. But our BDA was. All bombs within 10 meters and three sites destroyed. And and so when when the mission ended, we landed at uh, at Tuiwa, and a lot of folks came up to say hello. And those are the our squad of commanders who came out. And uh, that was kind of a, a very satisfying day. It was all of a sudden the last mission out of Phuket, a, a, a successful one that we managed to live through, and we got. Uh, to our new base and uh, where we were to stay the rest of the time. Yes? What about that caused you to be honored, though, differently than in other missions? I guess it was just the uh, the accuracy, the intensity of the ground fire, the accuracy of our delivery, and the fact that we responded without being briefed to what we had to do and responded quickly and did it and, and got out of there. So uh, they wrote that up. What was very nice about that, I gotta add, is that I that didn't get presented until I got to like it. And so when it got presented, my mom and dad were visiting. And they arranged they arranged for it to be presented by our wing commander, a guy named Bill Wisner, who was a World War II ace. And so my mom and dad got to see that presentation, which was kind of cool. The other one and the other one was a night alert mission off of Tuiwa, uh, where it was under the weather. Raining like hell, troops in contact, the close air support, the one that we wanted more than anything because you knew you were helping somebody out. And you know, the weather was so bad that they couldn't get the flare ship down beneath the clouds to drop flares by which you could see where to drop. Plus, there was a lot of ground fire. In one of my luckier bad decisions, uh, I said, well, I'll try it. And so we and Bob Putz, who had just returned from a misty forward fastback tour, came with me. He says, I'm coming too. And so we just slid down. We knew how high the ground was. And so we got, and we soon we got below the clouds, just with an unguided letdown. Then we could see, and you could see the flash of the ground fire and the fight going on. And the forward air controller, who was down there, was able to help, help us and see us because I, I, we kept the lights on, uh, you know, the, just the, flashing lights, although that might have been a good idea to turn them off later, but we had to be able to be seen and for him to see us. Once we got that, uh, that sighting done, then we set up a pattern around there. The forward air controller threw in a smoke rocket, and he said, it's very important that you go on this kind of heading for your run-in because the friendlies are right here. And as I showed in that one photograph, where the, the troops are, uh, our guys are right here. And so we made that, we made a pass, I made the first pass, couldn't see almost anything, and uh, uh, what a pucker! I'll tell you what. But uh, but we got the first uh, weapon on the ground that lit things up a bit, and so it was easier for the subsequent passes. It all worked out very well for for us, and the BDA was great. The army guys were thrilled, and and said so, and uh, and so we came came back, checked each other out, and were able to recover it. To about, and that is. That was November 19th, 1969. So one day, so the, tomorrow is the anniversary of that one. Wow. So what, what that, 45 years? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yes. Hey, uh, the, the photograph of uh, you flying in Arizona. Yeah. How, how high were you? 
probably 50, 30, 50, 30, 40, 50 feet, something like that. <laughs> as, long, as long as you could go and not a hit a saguaro. Yeah. <laughs> and, and of course, there were lots of uh, convection currents coming up from the, the desert. Yeah. So as you hammered along, it was bum, 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 bum. And it, it was just exhilarating. I mean, it was just so much fun. Just to yes, put your perspective, on November 19th, 1969, yes. the most dangerous thing that I was doing was paying the toll on the George Washington Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was very, very lucky. And, and just as, as I, I see it, I'm overstayed my time, but let me, let me just show you this. It's always, this is, uh, this is from the, uh, from the, uh, the wall, and this is a guy, this is my, uh, my best friend, a uh, guy named Paul Bass, who grew up wanting to do nothing more. He says, classically, Young men go off to war, serve their countries. And what I want to do is, at the end of the day, is go back and teach English at the University of Michigan. Sadly, that wasn't to be for him. And, uh, but I always carry a card with his name on it and got that on the wall from the, uh, from the Vietnam Veterans Wall. So, thank you. Hey,